Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, today's session uh, where the Kenya Green Building Society in collaboration with the World Resources Institute is hosting a virtual roundtable to discuss the prospects for net zero carbon buildings in the region. This is particularly important for us as the Kenya Green Building Society because um, as you might be aware, Kenya is the Africa climate change champion. And with, a, with an African COP in the horizon, this presents an op a unique opportunity for us as a Green bu Building Council, but separately for Kenya itself, because investors and leaders are looking to Kenya to be the leading voice in this conversation towards net zero, the fight against climate change, um, and of course, uh, in shaping discussions as we count down to COP27 and beyond. Recently, the president, the newly elected president of the Republic of Kenya, highlighted that climate change will be a key focus of this government. And separately, in Nairobi, the governor, Johnson Sakaja, recently announced that he would be looking at green bonds to help Nairobi County testing, testing. to help Nairobi County um, maximize its opportunities, um, both from a county perspective and on a national perspective. And it is with this in mind and against this backdrop that the journey towards net zero to ensure that we achieve these objectives um, is something that we prioritize as the Kenya Green Building Society. So without further ado, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you all uh, and, and, and discuss key, key, key themes that are affecting us as, as, a, as a country and as a building society, but separately also to hear from different experts who will contribute uh, in how the zero carbon or journey to net zero is something that we need to focus on um, as a country, as a green building society and as a region. Buildings, as you know, account to about 40% of, glo uh, of uh, global carbon dioxide emissions. So you cannot have a climate change conversation without having conversations around buildings, and uh, especially with respect to energy efficiency. I'm really excited to have the panelists today, and I will hand over to my colleague Louis, who will then introduce them before we kick off today's discussion. Over to you, Louis, and thank you, guys. Thank you, Nasra. Um, again, um, as Nasra has mentioned, and just echoing uh, the same sentiments, welcome to today's webinar and uh, day four of the World Green Building Week. Um, so, uh, without uh, much further ado, I will also introduce um, our moderator for today, um, Dylan, who will um, introduce himself further and then um, go on with um, giving an introduction to. Um, the Zero Carbon Building Accelerator, which is a program that KGBS, in collaboration with um, the World Resources Institute, is um, piloting this year with uh, Laikipia County. So um, the floor is yours, Dylan. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Thanks, Louis, for that. And uh, thanks, uh, Kenya Green Building Society, for doing such wonderful work to help the country accelerate energy efficiency in the building sector and for giving us it for organizing this and giving us an opportunity to present our work in the sector as well so my name is dylan subramanian i work as a manager for the energy efficiency program wri india i'm based out of india and actually in kerala which is the most state in india uh, to begin with uh, um, we will talk about the zero carbon building accelerator program that we we are running across different region and we recently we are starting we have started this in kenya as well uh, so uh, louis can we go to the first slide yeah so before talking about the zero carbon buildings accelerator program uh, it is mandatory to talk about the building efficiency accelerator program which started from 2015 to uh, 2020 so uh, 
since 2015, uh, WRI has led the Building Efficiency Accelerator Program with a global partnership of more than 60 cities in 27 countries. Uh, we had 70 private sectors, NGO partners, and city administration to help uh, accelerate building energy efficiency uh, and uh, uh, deploy building zero carbon buildings projects. Uh, personally, in, I was also part of this uh, building efficiency accelerator program in India, and we had an opportunity to uh, to benchmark building energy efficiency, building energy performance of 50 offices in Kochi, which is a small city in India. Uh, this exercise helped help the uh, building owners to understand their energy performance, building performance, and uh, we eventually we then created a research product out of that to help to uh, to help um, 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 accelerate the program at a different scale, at a larger scale throughout the country. So we are having different different like likewise we are having different sort of programs across the country and at different different regions as well the zero carbon buildings accelerator builds on this particular building efficiency accelerator program uh, we have uh, developed we are we are working on developing national roadmaps and aligned city action plans in colombia and turkey at the same time we are preparing city action plans for zero carbon buildings in laikipia county kenya sorry if i am not pronouncing the uh, name incorrect and Nagpur in India and a cluster of four cities in Costa Rica. So this is a background of uh, building uh, efficiency accelerator program and the uh, and the work that we uh, built on this uh, BEA, which is called Zero Carbon Buildings Accelerator Program. As I as I mentioned, uh, so everything started with building efficiency accelerator program. As you could see, the highlighted regions where we have spread the program in india uh, in mexico colombia and all these regions we have covered different different cities under the building efficiency accelerator and we realized that there is a need to uh, a need to improve need to uh, improve the ambition and that's how we thought of uh, how can we uh, start thinking from building efficiency to zero carbon buildings uh, um, that how can we make the transition happen and that's how the uh, origin of the zero carbon buildings platform started next slide louis and the zero carbon buildings accelerator program has got different different components the component one uh, is mainly on supporting national governments to develop national commitments and roadmap so all these roadmaps are having a timeline to uh, timeline set as 2050 by 2050 how can a nation uh, plan for its building to be zero carbon building. So we are focusing on two countries, Colombia and Turkey. Uh, the component two is sub-national strategies. It is important that whatever national strategies we build equally, uh, there should be efforts from sub-national governments and sub-national strategies should be set as well. And that way we uh, have we are supporting uh, sub-national governments to develop uh, a roadmap and action plan for cities as well. And we are in, we are including uh, we are we are making sure that uh, the action plan considers the financial and business models aspects of the cities. Component three is all about city pipelines for future scaling, technical assistance and peer learning pushing uh, building efficiency excellent networks cities towards zero carbon buildings ambition. At least three additional cities. We, we also we also envisage that at least three additional cities create uh, uh, zero carbon action plans in the future. Next slide. Okay. Thanks. Uh, the zero carbon building. So let's let's see what all things are covered under the zero carbon buildings action plan in Colombia, which is a national roadmap. To start with, uh, we have engaged different different uh, ministries: Ministry of Housing, Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development, Ministry of Planning, Ministry of en Energy, local authorities in Bogota and Cali. So as I mentioned, this is a collaborative effort, and it is important that each of these departments and ministries are informed about the importance of uh, energy efficiency, zero carbon buildings, and we that way we have made sure that the roadmap uh, has got. Uh, 
different different plans for each of these departments their responsibilities timeline for what they have to do and all those things were covered in the national plan and the national plan just got uh, um, launched in june 2022 it was presented by the ministry of environment and uh, but uh, it, it's in spanish right, it, right now but we are planning to develop a, an executive summary in english and if those who are in, interested to go through that please let us know we will definitely be in touch with you once the executive summary in english is ready next slide sir so anyway. Again, for Turkey, uh, we have involved the uh, Ministry of Environment, Urbanization and Climate Change, Department of Energy Efficiency, Climate Change Institute, and uh, we have uh, city action plans in Konya and Gaziantep. So this is ongoing work and we are expecting this roadmap to be launched very soon. Next slide, Louis. These are the eight broad steps to achieving net zero carbon buildings. Um, these are very broad measures, broad steps, I would say, but each of these steps are very important when we talk about zero carbon buildings. So the first step would be implement energy efficiency measures at, as, as a priority. It is a very it is a very important step. It's a primary step to make sure that energy efficiency is being uh, considered while we, uh, while we think of building a design. Uh, reduce energy use with passive and climate friendly cooling. Uh, cooling, as you would all agree, uh, cooling is becoming an energy intensive exercise. And uh, with the global warming and the climate change, we can always expect the cooling, the energy consumed for the cooling purpose to go uh, high. So it is, it is very important for the buildings to prepare themselves uh, to maintain the thermal comfort within the building through passive and climate friendly design aspects. Electrify building space and water heating in advance of uh, cleaner grid. Apply digital controls and technology to optimize energy and demand. Engage occupants uh, and implement operational best practices. Meet energy needs with on-site local and purchased renewable energy. It is important that whatever energy, even though even if we uh, integrate all the energy efficiency measures, passive design elements, uh, there will be some energy consumption will always be there and we have to make sure that that energy is coming from a renewable source and that energy is uh, green and then only we can say that a building, a zero carbon building is not at all emitting uh, anything um, um, back to the environment. Reduce life cycle emission and embodied carbon of materials. This is something which we often forget when we talk about uh, buildings and or we always emphasize on operational energy consumption. But at the same time, it is very important that we have to look at the life cycle emissions and the embodied carbon of the materials, the, how how we are sourcing the materials, the, how sustainable the construction materials are. And all these things have to be considered as well while we talk about net zero carbon buildings. Compensate for residual carbon emissions with high quality offsets as well. Uh, next slide, please. So these these are the different different uh, um, different sectors that we covered under the set CBA uh, road plan. So interaction with the uh, with the urban context, material supply, construction, use, operation, and maintenance, deconst deconstruction. So this is something which is very much uh, in relation with the previous slide as well. So interaction with the urban context is in line with uh, how we do the site management even before before we uh, construct the building it is important that how we maintain the site how we develop the site and it has to be sustainable and all those things have to be made sure material supply again we have to make sure of the um, embodied carbon of the material construction has to be sustainable and operation with the energy efficient appliance and energy with the passive uh, design element we have we have to make sure that uh, we are the the building is using as much less energy as possible and deconstruction with uh, what are what after the lifespan of a building like we have to make sure that even if we uh, de even the deconstruction of the building has to be done in a sustainable way next slide please Luis. 
I already mentioned about the importance of a stakeholder engagement. Whoever be involved in the process uh, exercise. This is not a standalone exercise. Everyone has got something to contribute, and everyone is responsible to make. Um, um, if we are thinking about making all the buildings zero carbon buildings, each of the stakeholders will have their own responsibilities, and uh, um, so that way, which are the stakeholders? So national and provincial governments are the important stakeholders local governments energy utilities energy utilities will have to make sure that most of the energy that they are supplying under their portfolio are coming from renewable sources developers and self help builders design and construction professionals they have to be they have to be um, capacitated to make sure that they know how to build a sustainable building green building uh, water efficient energy efficient buildings um, for that education system has to be um, it has to be changed or have to, has to consider uh, incorporating sustainable design practices suppliers and manufacturers financial service providers and investors building owners and managers building occupants and even if even after we do everything it is important that the if the occupants are not aware of the importance of energy conservation there is a big chance there is a it is very likely that um, uh, all these efforts might go away, going away. So it is important that uh, the equipment's uh, behavioral aspects have to be changed to make sure that they are operating in a sustainable manner. And once we bridge these stakeholders uh, with uh, with the innovative ideas, uh, with the appliance and systems, uh, the clean energy exercise, uh, we can definitely achieve the zero carbon buildings target. Next slide, please, uh, Louis. This again talk about the different um, stakeholder engagement that we had with uh, while developing the set CBA uh, uh, action plan for the for Colombia. Uh, I'm not repeating this. Uh, this is kind of an again uh, similar kind of exercise. Next slide, Louis. So let's see what are the what were the insights from the set CBA uh, in Colombia. Uh, what we have found was policy and regulatory actions have the largest impact on reducing emissions, energy efficiency, clean energy use, and decarbonization of the energy grid. All these things are very important, really important. Regulatory barriers and technology accessibility issues must be re resolved as well. Um, and then only uh, the utilities will be able to or at least the builders will be able to if, the, if a builder wants to source green energy from a particular source the regulatory uh, ecosystem has to be supportive to make sure that uh, the builders are flexible enough to or the building owners are flexible enough to source green clean energy existing buildings are posed to be a challenge most regulations are requiring water and energy savings in buildings target new construction uh, embodied carbon again uh, largest gaps for implementing set CBs. Most of the uh, stakeholders are not at all aware of uh, embodied carbon, the importance of uh, looking into it. Next slide, uh, So these are the new six new set CBA cities in 2022. Uh, as you can see, like like Ipia County in Kenya is one among them. Nagpur uh, in India, again, they have uh, agreed to be a part of this program. And in Costa Rica, Costa Rica we have a cluster of four cities. Uh, they, we will also be developing city action plans for this cluster as well. Next slide. Uh, for the CTB in Nagpur, India, um, we are developing a city action plan for the building decarbonization aligned with the local context. And we do have uh, two, India, the, India does have two policies, which is called Energy Conservation Building Code, which is exclusively for the commercial buildings, and Eco Nibo Samhita, which is for the residential complexes. Uh, so we are seeing how we can um, align these policies, how we can effectively make use of these policies to um, to achieve zero carbon building um, buildings in um, Nagpur. We are also building on broad stakeholder agreement and adoption for solar thermal and we are PV energy as well. Challenges, of course, addressing sustainable materials and waste management is a big challenge in Nagpur. 
uh, it will be it is important that the local government the city administration uh, support us in doing this and once we develop the uh, city action plan it is very important that uh, the nagpur city administration takes most of the recommendations and implement them on ground the set cba in laikipia county kenya uh, through close collaboration with the kenya green building society laikipia county will train county staff on green buildings and the ed certification uh, take stock of the country's building to know where and how they can improve immediately this is very important uh, to know how the buildings are performing right now uh, the baseline establishment is very important then only we can uh, plan for improvement we can see where we stand and what we can achieve in a say for example in five years ten years time down the lane and we will also plan to write a zero carbon building city action plan to identify what improvements can happen where by whom and along what timeline as i mentioned it will be a collective effort there will be a lot of stakeholders involved and it is important to define the responsibility and actions for each of the stakeholders and to make sure that they are um, they are prepared they are prepared and capacitated to um, to fulfill their responsibilities next slide Dolly. yeah thanks that's it um, that's it from my side uh, if there are any questions or anything uh, we will request you to please add them on chat so whatever is convenient okay thank you very much Dylan, for that presentation on um, the zero carbon buildings accelerator and it's also good to know the history of the accelerator starting with the building efficiency program and um, that was there earlier before moving on to what we're doing now with the counties um, some exciting things that you've seen over there, especially in what we do to keep the county, and more of which will be elaborated on in the next section of the um, of the webinar. So again, I'll just remind um, the attendees of the webinar if you have any questions, because I'm sure there's a lot that you've seen in this presentation that you can like ask on. Please um, place the questions in the question and answer section of um, go to webinar as we continue and we'll address it in the question and answer session. So as we go to the next part of this, the panel discussion on the pathway to net zero buildings in Kenya, um, I will call again Dylan, um, who is the moderator for this session, to come in and introduce the rest of our um, panelists as they also, um, as I also kindly ask that uh, our panelists and also the moderator um, have their um, webcams on for this part of the discussion. So over to you, Dylan. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Louis, for that. Uh, again, thanks, uh, 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 Kenya Green Building Society, for giving me an opportunity to moderate this session. I'm very happy to, very excited to see the panel, very eminent list of panelists. We have representation from government, uh, we have representation from public sector, private sector, and I hope this uh, discussion will be productive enough to help the Kenya Building. Uh, Kenya Green Building Society and WRI to prepare their action plan going forward. Uh, so I'll start with, um, uh, sorry if I'm again, uh, if I'm not pronouncing it uh, right. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll welcome Chris Kimanga, uh, who is the director for Mining and uh, Natural Resources, the county of the county government of uh, Laikipia. Uh, welcome Chris Kimanga and welcome Nixon Bukachi, who is working as a senior re renewable energy officer, energy petroleum and uh, regulatory authority, Kenya. Uh, then I welcome, then we have uh, Elizabeth uh, Shigi, uh, uh, who, is, uh, who is working as an energy efficiency and cooling specialist for sustainable energy for all. Uh, we have then uh, Maurosa Chikwana, who is the development director at uh, Africa Logistics Properties. Welcome all. I hope I'm audible to all. So I can only see uh, Elizabeth here. So do we have other panelists as well? Yes, someone, Dylan. <clears throat> trying to figure oh, out how to get the camera working. Okay, no worries, <laughs> sure. 
so i have uh, a few set of uh, i have a few very uh, generic question to start with uh, maybe i can uh, start with uh, chris chris are you there uh, yes i'm here am i audible yes you are audible thanks for uh, uh, clarifying that chris uh, so chris uh, can we start with uh, the status of accelerating energy efficiency in, in kenya what are your perspectives on that uh, like how how far kenya has progressed in the recent years and uh, uh, what are what, what do you see kenya um, in the next 5 years or next 10 years basically what is the status of accelerating energy efficiency in kerala as of now in kenya um i i could say okay first of all um thank you uh, kgbs for organizing this uh, webinar and thank you for also inviting me to the panel so i'd like to say it's uh, the adoption of uh, uh, energy efficiency particularly in our buildings is uh, is a bit low however um there is um there is quite an interest and a growing interest at that in um in adoption of the same um so we are about um we have two levels of government that is national and uh, devolved county governments and uh with devolved county governments we've seen um you know um really rapid infrastructure uh development and um unlike back in the day when you had capital cities and small towns we are seeing you know a growth in other economic centers within the counties and what this means is that uh, there is more public investment in uh, infrastructure by government and there is also more development from from the private sector in residential commercial industrial and other other developments and so there is an increased interest in seeing how do i deliver value and uh, energy efficiency and sustainability in construction is um, is the next step to go so it is low but we we are seeing an increased interest both from government and uh, from private sector in changing the way we do our construction and going for sustainability as as a value add in our developments. Yeah, thanks, Chris, for that. Uh, so, Chris, uh, uh, so when you say that, uh, I understand that there are two different level of uh, governments. Uh, and how do you see the um, the communication between these two level of governments in terms of energy efficiency? So, whatever programs being developed at the national level. Um, do you see it uh, making an impact to the subnational government? Yes, thank you. Um, so yes, you're right. Um, so a lot of functions rest with the national government and uh, you have some functions that are shared and some that are fully devolved to the county government. And so I'll, I'll use I'll use my docket as an example. So the Ministry of Energy um, is supporting the county is in developing a county energy plan and like Ipia county is in that program and the county energy plan is um looks at the needs that the county has and um we we are able to forecast and say that um seeing how like Ipia is growing we expect this kind of energy demand in the future so we have our current demand energy demand uh, we are factoring in um, needs from various stakeholders and we need a roadmap to to bridge the gap and and ensure that you know development is not um, curtailed by the lack of energy and energy efficiency is a big conversation at that so that we are able to use the energy that we have materials water in a sustainable way and so the we are seeing a good communication between two the two governments in other areas such as affordable housing we like Ipia County is is um, is coordinating its efforts with national government so that the lessons learned in doing the national government affordable housing projects are improved upon at county level. So the communication is good. We can see that um, national government is supporting counties where they can, 
and uh, county governments are also doing a lot in because county governments at the end of the day will approve these developments will be able to guide and you could say county governments are at the grassroots or at the household level and we can actually drive impact and influence and um, support and promote the adoption of sustainability so national government is doing policy uh, county governments are able to say domesticate these policies and these legislations to fit the different context of each county and are able to also roll out and uh, promote the same um, at the basic level that is the household or at the development uh, level yeah fair enough uh, chris uh, i i actually wanted to know more about uh, resources uh, that you have for uh, uh, implementing the policies that that's being developed at the national level but i'll come back to you before that i, I will go to elizabeth to um, to understand her perspectives on the level of uh, energy efficiency um, status in kenya so over to you elizabeth can you talk a bit about the current status in kenya um, and thank you very much um, for having me here, especially this World Green Building Week uh, 2022. And thank you, WRI and KGBS, uh, for this session. Um, coming from a macro level, first of all, from SC for All, Sustainable Energy for All, I'd like to uh, take note that uh, the focus on energy efficiency has been really good in Kenya, first of all. Um, and Kenya leads a lot of African countries around this. But globally, we still haven't done enough. We still haven't. Um, we're actually off track in meeting the SDG 7.3 goal of energy efficiency, which is uh, doubling the rate of energy efficiency by uh, 2030. So it means as much as what we've done uh, to date, we still have to do a lot more if we're going to meet this goal by 2030. Now, coming back to what Kenya has done, um, and I know my counterpart from EPRA will talk more to this. Um, in the last few years, uh, Kenya developed um, an energy efficiency and conservation strategic plan. Uh, it was led by the Ministry of Energy, uh, the Renewable uh, Energy Department. So with that strategic plan, there was a great opportunity to have to concentrate the efforts around five sectors. Um, and this is the first time that we saw that buildings actually centered upon a strategic plan towards meeting the national determined contributions uh, that Kenya's put forward. So, um, you know, focusing on the buildings, by the way, there's also transport, um, there's households, and with households and buildings, they're very closely related anyway, the buildings. Um, and also now there's industry and agriculture, um, and now utilities. Now, uh, for energy efficiency itself, there was, um, it's great to have these policies and strategic plans, and I'm glad you brought in the element about implementation, was um, the target was that within five years of that strategic plan was to have an implementation plan. And I can actually say that as of, um, as of today, as we speak, and as of last week, it was uh, confirmed that the implementation plan that SE for All supported uh, the process of validation early in the year um, has actually been signed off um, and the implementation plan now goes into the details of what we actually need to do and some of the aspects we're asking to be done for energy efficiency is definitely um, around uh, buildings and cities uh, using passive design you know similar to india uh, kenya has you know fantastic weather and there's great opportunity to take advantage of our daylight, to take advantage of our natural ventilation, and also for our buildings to be built for this climat climatic effect and change um, as well. Um, from the passive design principles uh, on energy efficiency, there's also looking at standards that ensure the buildings that are currently being designed meet the minimum standards um, and those uh, standards also are targeting net zero, so they're not standards that are standalone. Uh, the other aspect as well I'd like to mention around this is use of um, highly efficient equipment in buildings, but not having to 
install them just because we can, but uh, installing them on the basis of demand of actually what's needed by the people using the buildings. And um, beyond that, looking at low carbon solutions within the sites of the buildings, then looking at um, low carbon solutions near the site of the building, and then now we can say off-site. Um, Kenya itself, on that basis, and with the help of Kenya Green Building Society, has really um, aligned uh, towards the net zero carbon buildings. Uh, we have one of the companies, one of the speakers today, who will actually talk about them also being coming on board on the commitment for net zero carbon buildings uh, that's being worked on by the World Green Building Council. So we can see there's a lot of strategies to align towards energy efficiency. And I'm glad that we have Lake Ipia County on the call as well, because it's good to have policies and national uh, targets, but implementation is on the ground and the opportunity around the counties um, having their own action plan, their own narrative, uh, because the counties are different. You know, you find others are highly agricultural. So we have to look at what are the opportunities around um, uh, energy efficiency around that and the use of the buildings, manufacturing sites, um, cold chains as well. How are we using energy uh, around those agricultural areas? So the built environment has been uh, key to actually giving us a solution around energy efficiency to start with. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Elizabeth, for that detailed explanation. Looks like Kenya is on the right track to uh, to achieve uh, uh, energy efficiency in their larger portfolio. Uh, now I will look for uh, uh, Nixon. Nixon, can you please share your thoughts on the status of uh, Kenya's uh, existing energy efficiency? Nixon, are you there? Uh, am I audible, Elizabeth? Yes. Hello, yes. Um, it seems that Nixon hasn't joined in yet. You can uh, okay, speak I to the next person. I'm not able to see the panelist list. That's why. Okay. So I will now go to uh, uh, Maruza. Maruza Hi, Dylan. Hi, Maruza. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yes. Maruza, can Apologies, you hear me? Um, no worries. It looks like you might have to give us permissions to share camera, but I can talk. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that's fine. We are we are eager to listen to you anyway, Marusa. Please uh, please share your thoughts on India's ongoing efforts and the level of uh, energy efficiency. Okay, I'm going to try not to repeat anything um, the other panelists have said um, because we are in Kenya together. But I'll give you my perspective as a developer. So I really can only influence what I'm in control of. And in terms of the status of accelerating this energy efficiency in Kenya, I'd like to say we're, it's quite high. Like um, we're really excited. Every single building that we develop and build and put on the market is energy efficient and certified and audited accordingly. So <clears throat> as a business, we've made a commitment that we won't be building anything else. That is just what we do. So if it's not energy efficient, we just don't deliver it. So from our perspective, we're doing okay. Um, we've put on about 75,000 square meters in the last five years, over 10 buildings. Um, as far as the industry is going, it's harder for, for us to tell um, because one of the things is what's, what's the metric that is used to demonstrate that there is a large take up of energy efficient buildings in Kenya. So unfortunately, sometimes we as you know private players don't get that macro visibility. But from that micro perspective, we're definitely um, accelerating the move towards net zero. Thanks, Dylan. Yeah, this is excellent to know, uh, Marissa. So, uh, uh, so how do you see uh, from a demand perspective when you say that uh, you are building energy efficient buildings? How do you see? Uh, how do you make sure it's being marketed at the right sense and how, and are the 
uh, uh, occupants are uh, interested to to uh, buy such real estate properties do you see any sort of uh, uh, market value in doing that definitely we do um the honest truth is people don't come to lease a warehouse from us because of its energy efficiency um it's 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 like a value add it's a it's a tangible benefit they get after making the decision to move into a building um the market is getting smarter and they're, they're more aware of the carbon footprint and the environmental impact that you know these buildings have considering we contribute 40 percent of you know the greenhouse gas emissions just as an industry so what we try to do is we just make it front and center so in all our marketing efforts and all our pr in all in all discussions and leasing and just operations we always always drum back that 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 point that listen you're going to be better off than your neighbor who's not um energy efficient and we can demonstrate that through your utility savings so you're literally going to save money by leasing this building as opposed to that building and typically for us a building let me use an example 10,000 square meter warehouse in kenya um, at 14 cents per kilowatt hour your utility bills will be about seven thousand us dollars per month in the buildings that we're building which are energy efficient that is reduced by 45 percent so our tenants utility bills come down from seven thousand a month to three thousand eight hundred dollars a month and that's when we get their attention all of a sudden they're like whoa okay and that's going straight to my bottom line and i don't have to do anything else because you've already designed it and that's when they get excited and then they find out more about the benefits of energy efficiency thanks Dan. yeah this is excellent to to know uh, Marisa. so 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 you are you are doing this uh, through passive design strategies right passive design and construction elements you are you are making this 40 percentage savings possible absolutely it's a combination but that's Energy the very first right. thing to do. yes yeah because that's free we're sitting on the equator we've got these beautiful south southeasterly winds so just by orienting your building in the right way you're automatically on the journey you're already there you're you know so the hard work is already done and um yeah so we definitely definitely do take advantage of passive design principles we try to avoid mechanical ventilation in the warehouse spaces mm. so we just try to be smart and use mother nature because it's free at the end of the day and it's the most efficient designer great to know that Marusa. Uh, so I will now go to Chris to understand uh, the different challenges uh, that subnational governments are facing, and how how best how can we uh, overcome these challenges uh, to make sure that uh, these energy efficiency strategies are deployed. Chris, can you please uh, list down one or two uh, primary challenges that you are facing from a subnational point of view? Hello, Chris. Uh, Louis, uh, Chris is still there? Yes, he is. Um, Chris, if you are trying to speak, you are on mute, I think. Hello, am I audible? Yes, Chris. Yeah. I'm audible now. All right. heard, I, I think. Sorry. The question, right? Yes, I've heard the question. Um, you're asking about uh, a few challenges that um, yes that we have seen in um, yes um, yes. The from the we... point, what what were the main my main challenges, uh, Chris? All right. So I would say um primarily knowledge that uh, we people don't know how how 
how easy or how simple or how um, practical it is to to factor in um you know to build green or sustainably um and so what you're seeing is just a um a trend a similar trend in in the design and construction so if people don't know if the practitioners don't know what to do then they'll just keep doing what they've been doing and um we can see this through the um the, the building trends um the ongoing projects that we're seeing the approvals people are making the designs that uh even us as government are generating from uh, you know from uh, public works so whether we're doing if you're doing a hospital a school a market um government offices the trend is quite similar and it's uh you know sort of they 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 we don't there is no reinvention of the wheel it worked in the past and it's working right right now so there is little knowledge in how to to reduce uh carbon emissions in our buildings both from a materials perspective um in construction in design um and also in operations so with little knowledge then adoption is quite low um i could also say there is um there is little or very little incentive for people to move towards uh, you know sustainable buildings uh because there is no incentive towards it so that now comes back to us as government in how do we incentivize how do we promote uh, sort of a carrot and stick method how do we promote adoption um, so both as a government by exemplifying the same in our developments but also promoting the same so whether you are uh, manufacturing you know um good material whether you are putting up a good development whether you will uh, stay in a green building uh, so there is no incentive so people will if they they'll, they'll see that you know if it's um if there is no incentive towards going green why should i go green you know why should i source material from very far uh, simply because it's green rather than use material that is uh within close proximity in like ipia um and build as i've done so i could say um top two knowledge in that uh, people thanks chris i see a uh, an absolute similarity know. in the case of india as well so here also it be we face right. similar kind of situation so knowledge is a primary issue awareness is an issue at the same time people will definitely ask you questions on why would we do that that's exactly why i was quite surprised to see that uh, maruza was success successful in um, building green buildings and marketing it in a uh, in a right way uh, very much promising and elizabeth the uh, next question is to you on the since you are coming from this cooling um, cooling background energy efficiency and cooling background uh, how do you see uh, sustainable cooling opportunities in kenya and so also how inclusive and uh, equity uh, when you when you when you see the sustainable cooling from that sort of a sense uh, cooling is not just that sort of a is not completely related to energy efficiency thermal comfort it's it's more than that it's related to productivity it's it's a it's a, it's a right i would say to uh, the people it's not uh, it's not something luxury no more so that way how do you see uh, kenya uh, kenya maintaining the sustainable cooling activities well i think that is something that uh, needs um, quite a bit of input and implementation so similarly uh, with the rest of the world kenya hasn't really put cooling um, at the forefront of the conversation energy access was uh, first of all the priority but now with the population increase and also with the climate change and the heat stress um, that uh, we're going to see and we're seeing, you know, we're experiencing this heat stress uh, now and going up to 2030 and 2050. For the population that can afford, they go and buy fans, uh, they go and buy uh, air conditioning, especially our commercial sector, our hotels, uh, they're being built with air conditioning units. So there's a great opportunity around the policy side, especially for highly efficient 
uh, cooling equipment for thermal comfort around buildings. Um, and that's after using passive design. The other element as well is, for example, when you talk about cooling, uh, people might think it's just a commercial cooling, but we most of us have refrigerators in the house. So consideration of how much energy we're wasting with the refrigerators, especially if they're not energy efficient, um, and having done a bit of study in the market, we see there's an opportunity to really have, you know, five-star rated uh, refrigerators in the shops. Um, it's been a bit difficult to actually get those. You most of the times you'll get one star uh, rated uh, equipment. So there's opportunity to really improve on that so that people can save more uh, energy, especially uh, through the cooling sector. I'd like to also add now uh, the opportunity around this conversation on cold chains. Because Kenya might say, oh, we are developing the cold chains now, and it's good we have ALP warehouse here as well. Um, but what is going to be there in the next 10 years or in the next 20 years under cold chains? All that will need energy. Um, so the imperative is that we definitely move away from, uh, sorry, from uh, just looking at cooling on the thermal comfort side, but also set standards, uh, performance standards, policy, but also educate and create awareness of the consumers, because they're the ones who are going to have that behavioral shift uh, towards um, the element around cooling. And we're seeing that, you know, globally one in seven people are at risk um, from uh, heat stress. And the performance of people is also diminished. Now, if we talk about vulnerable communities and we have uh, urban populations also as vulnerable communities, we have the rural people in vulnerable areas, they, they can't afford um, air conditioning. Sorry, so the opportunity there as well is that um, we have to consider how and where these people work because people become inefficient. And ILO has put numbers there of how much we actually lose uh, globally, and I know in Kenya as well, on the performance of people. I know when you talk about built environments, sometimes we just think about people in offices who have thermal comfort considered in their designs. But then there's all these people who work in areas like. Um, an area called industrial area, and that's a very hot area. And um, if if, they, if we have the hot days, the performance of the people is diminished. Uh, in rural areas, even in the farms, people's performance is diminished. So cooling itself is becoming not just um, an equipment conversation, um, and it's not just a refrigeration conversation. It's a conversation around human beings being able to live through. Uh, climate activity that has shown that the, there's global warming. So uh, I think there's a lot of work to go, all the way from national government, county government, and also uh, awareness of the communities. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Elizabeth, for that. Uh, absolutely right on that. Uh, it's not just an appliance conversation, or it's just not just a um, what you say a passive design conversation it has to be a collective effort from different different important stakeholders for sure to identify the vulnerable community and to make sure that uh, um, uh, their 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 uh, well-being and productivity are being saved okay uh, marissa my last question is to you from a private player perspective how do you see uh, what are the challenges that you are facing uh, to to uh, to go in the direction of uh, energy efficient buildings um thanks Dylan. <clears throat> i think i'd say I'd, I'd i'd break it down into about three and the first one being the actual like what we can do like as as players in industry and then what others can do so first one is commitment like the fact that there's only a handful of companies, if that, that have actually committed to being part of the solution on reducing our environmental footprint and going net zero. That's my biggest concern. That's the biggest challenge, because if no one's actually just committing to do it, how do we expect to get there? Yeah. And then closer to home in terms of the challenges I'm facing, because I've made the commitment. Right, so I'm putting my hand up on behalf of all my shareholders and my stakeholders and my tenants and my contractors and my consultants, and we're saying, 
as a developer, this is the way we are going and we're not looking back. <clears throat> so the second thing then is now, what's my footprint, yeah? So started investing in, in, the, in the research to understand what's our actual footprint because without knowing what that is, it's very hard to try and reduce it. And then the third step that we're taking towards going to net zero, which we're finding to be a really big challenge, is reducing the embodied carbon footprint in the materials that we use for our buildings. Because unfortunately, we don't manufacture them. Yeah. So, so before we, like, once we've finished construction, you've really locked in close to 12% of global emissions just from the materials. And our two biggest materials are steel and cement and concrete. Yeah. And the steel industry, unfortunately, for the last 200 years, they've been heavily reliant on those traditional blast furnaces, which emit about 3 billion tons of CO2 every year because it's all based on fossil fuels. So trying to get that industry to transition to like green steel is probably one of the biggest challenges I'm going to have in my career. And so we're investing a lot in understanding what a guy is doing, especially like in Sweden, is a company called Hybrid, who's using oxygen instead of like the iron ore, um, with the iron, instead of the oxygen, yeah, anyway, sorry. The, the byproduct is water as opposed to CO2. So the challenge with that is, is that it's currently about 30% more expensive than our traditional steel. So although we want to move there and use it, we can't afford it. So we're waiting and we're watching and we're seeing. And then the second and final challenge we've got is with cement and concrete and just the sheer amount of, of CO2 emitted during like the production of the, the actual product. And so I guess those are the challenges I'm facing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, having found a solution myself, but the Kenya Green Building Society has been really instrumental. They came up with a solution called the Jenga Green Library. And what it does, it allows developers like myself to just log on to the app and understand where I can procure different materials that have already got a lower embodied footprint. And so that just makes our lives easier in terms of making the decisions. And yeah, that's that's pretty much where, where I'm at um, at the moment. Thanks, Dylan. Hello, Hello Dylan. Can you sorry, sorry. I was on I was on mute. Uh, so I was saying that in the interest of time, uh, we have to close this interesting discussion, I must say. Uh, uh, so very valid points are raised by Marusa at last, like he clearly pointed out the finance aspects, so the economic aspects of energy efficiency, and we have to wait for the right technology to come to employ them to make sure that we are doing this economic friendly as well. So these are important points, very important points from Chris as well in terms of the um, the communications that are happening between national government and subnational government and uh, uh, very interested, very excited to know that they are on the right track. They have the right plans uh, set for achieving um, achieving energy efficiency going forward in the building sector and I'm particularly happy to hear from Elizabeth about the cooling projects so the cooling the, the priority has to be given uh, since cooling is not a sector wise kind of a thing it is important that we need to make sure that cooling is being integrated in into the action plans and make sure that sustainable cooling is being uh, is uh, is accessible to all the vulnerable communities etc very interesting indeed uh, but in the interest of time I have to stop this uh, discussion right now and over to you uh louis thanks thanks everyone uh thanks all the panelists again okay. louis over to you okay um thank you very much dylan and thank you again to all the panelists um for the very insightful discussion and um honest remarks on uh, where we are currently at um, as far as energy efficiency 
um, the road to net zero is concerned. So uh, moving on to the Q&A, um, I'll remind you again to pose any questions or remarks that you may have on this on the chat. Um, so from what I am seeing currently, that isn't, um, just give me a minute to see the questions. Yes, so we have a couple of questions over here. So how can we as an industry make the push for zero carbon from embodied carbon side, ensuring from the word go the materials we select for our buildings are sustainable, especially um, since green building materials are substantially more expensive than conventional materials? Um, this question is posed to Minpa. Sorry, who did you say it's posed to me? Um, it's open. If you have a response, you can go ahead. Okay. I'll just a quick comment. Um, it's uh, it's a, a lot of people think that it's automatically more expensive to build green. That is not true in every circumstance. There's so many ways that you can build green and not have an incremental cost to your building, your your construction budget. So, so you, using things like the Edge app really makes it easy for you to actually see the incremental costs that they are. And just as an example, my last building, I had a lot of initiatives that we implemented that were green, and some were over and above the traditional spec, but the budget didn't increase by more than 3% as a worst case. So that was just a comment, just in case, um, yeah, it is helpful. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Um, so um, if there isn't any other comment from the rest of our panelists, allow me to go to the second question. Um, the building stock will double in the next 40 years, with India and Africa being where uh, most of it will happen. 25.5 billion square meters and 25.6 billion square meters respectively. Energy efficiency and decarbonization um, we can deal with. Embodied carbon will be where the challenge is. Um, how can we hedge against this on the race to zero? Um, again, this question is open. Maybe I can give it a try. Uh, so I'll talk about India. In India, it's a uh, it said that uh, more than 70 percentage of the buildings are yet to be built uh, and the most of the cities will see a lot of buildings in the coming years as well so it, it all depends on the policies that we make now and uh, how prepared are we to make sure that the buildings that we are going to build are efficient say for example we uh, in india we have this energy conservation building code which uh, which mandates all the um, all the commercial buildings with connected load greater than 100 kilowatt has to build in a particular way that is energy efficient and has to deploy energy efficient appliances, etc. So that's always there. But again, as Chris mentioned, the policies will be developed, the action, the building codes will be developed at a national level. And it's up to the subnational governments and states within the country to make sure that these things are actually mandated or deployed on ground. There, this communication has to be done. The, the capacity building has to be done, the awareness has to be built, incentives and all those things have to be provided to make sure that these are actually all, whatever positives what we are seeing in these uh, policies um, have to reach on ground. And for that, Hi, Dylan. I think you've um, muted yourself. Muted yourself. I can add to what Dylan is saying when he finds his uh, microphone, and I think it's uh, you know directly to Kenya. We need those building codes. Um, you know, at the moment we uh, don't have a ratified, uh, validated building code that we can use. Um, that's aligned to towards the net zero goals. I mean, that's that's a first place. 
and also one thing um, uh, Dylan presented as well was that there's a, a residential building code in India that is also aligning towards energy efficiency for residential buildings. I mean, these are things that we should definitely have um, for us, for all of us to have a common goal um, around the built environment. Thank you, Louis. Thank you as well, um, Elizabeth. And um, I think um, the question has been well answered. So allow me to go to the third question. And um, the final question has received. Um, the green alternative materials have standards for purposes of control. Again, another open ended question. Sorry, I didn't get the question on that. Okay, um, the question is Do green alternative materials have standards for purposes of control? Uh, yes, I can start. I can start commenting on that. Yes, I mean um, this is the purpose of having bodies like caps in countries as well. Um, all materials have standards, um, and it's not a matter of separating green and uh, non-green materials. It's a matter of having, um, you know, the performance of the material. And when we talk about green materials, it's also that they're clear, transparent uh, performance measures that are indicated so that. Uh, the people using those materials uh, know what they're selecting for their buildings um, and also, also that gives the element of competition within the materials manufacturers so that they always work towards having better performing materials um, that can be used in the sector thank you Hello. louis thank you, yes um i would like to contribute uh but mine will touch more on the previous question on uh, embodied carbon in materials um and 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 mine will be to say so if if you would want um adoption of materials and maybe perhaps as um as one of the panelists had mentioned that um you can find that you know if 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 it's, if it's steel for example green steel is uh, about 30% uh, costlier than the regular steel that we have. So if we'd want that cost to be more affordable, then government is easily capable of influencing that. And how would we do that? If you have manufacturers doing green material and uh, have incentives to promote the manufacturing of such materials, then ultimately the cost uh, will be pulled down. And so how, how private sector can do that is that they can influence government to promote such, uh, such things. So if you can demonstrate that you are developing green, you are uh, uh, developing materials that are green, or you're building up, a, you're putting up a development that is green, then you can, you can put your case for that, you know what, promote this industry and uh, create incentives so that if the developer is spending more, and how can he uh, save? If you are manufacturing such material, how can you, you know, will you will you reduce the the taxes? Will you reduce the prices of the inputs as an incentive? You could also, you know, incentivize energy costs so that if you're using this much energy, <clears throat> like Lajipia County is doing energy rebates for manufacturers at thirty percent. And what that will effectively do is one reduce the input costs and also also make the product much more competitive um, in the market. So I think government can do that with the assistance and with the you know increasing uh, appeal. Sorry, increasing yeah, like like increasing uh, interest and pressure from the private sector and from manufacturers to promote the industry. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, hopefully, um, the sentiments that have been brought forth by our audience have been answered. And um, I can certainly say that we've come to an end of the Q&A discussion. Um, we'll hand over to the closing bit of this webinar, and we'll start with closing remarks from the panelists, starting with um, 
Elizabeth. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Louis, and thank you for this um, very important session. I do believe that um, net zero buildings in Kenya need to be at the center of Kenya's growth. Um, and um, the opportunity, I'll turn my video on as well, the opportunity is actually to be part of the green economy, uh, not a separate aspect. And it has always been a matter of, um, um, you know, developers who want to be rather than must be part of uh, green buildings. So it needs to be inherent in our standards as soon as now, otherwise we'll miss the opportunity to actually uh, save on emissions, save on energy and other resources. Um, and it's not just one building at a time, we, we can look at cities as well. And through this program called Net Zero Carbon Buildings Accelerator, there's a great opportunity to accelerate this action. Um, and parting short is that, you know, as much as we say we, we have global warming um, and we have to uh, mitigate and adapt around it, the opportunity as well is that we have the solutions, we have the skill sets and the technologies available. And um, as Professor Wangari Matai said, um, it doesn't take a diploma to plant a tree. So even as in the built environment, we're asking you to plant trees in the cities because you'll get um, even up to 10 degrees worth of cooling um, around that. And all the information is available. You can come to se for all uh, .org website, the WRI website, the solutions of cooling, solutions on energy efficiency that are well detailed on how you can take that on board. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And um, particularly enjoyed the closing remarks you've given by Angari Matai there. So um, next is Chris. Um, yes, so what I can say is that, um, you know, we are all uh, very important stakeholders. And um, as my colleagues had earlier put it, one, we need to commit to, to these efforts. And after committing, we also need to participate in whichever way we can. So whether it's at policy level, legislation, uh, supporting, whether it's in actual uh, developing or manufacturing, each person has a role to play. And um, we should play that role, um, participate, um, in um, engage the government, engage other policymakers, engage um, everybody in the in the value chain, so that we are able to have a common ground. So that if you are in this space of uh, sustainable development, how can how can the manufacturer assist you? How can the government assist you? Engage. It's a consultative thing and. Um, as government, we we can only uh, promote you where we where where we don't understand the pinch point. You understand the pinch point better, and it is only for you to 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 engage and participate and say that I'm doing this. How can the government assist these efforts? And I'm sure once we are able to do this, we are able we will be able to to have a better outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, moving on to Maruza. Hi, thanks, Louis. Um, I guess my my closing remark is more um, a challenge. Um, I, I'm not I'm not sure who's in the room, but my assumption is that we're all in the built environment, and we have something to do with buildings, be it for work, play, uh, rest, or whatever. And if that's the case, then we have a moral obligation to fix the mess that our industry is contributing to our environment. 40% of the problem sits within this room. You get what I mean? So, so we can't be on the fence. We can't be like, oh, yes, maybe we should. OK, is it more expensive? Is it not? You just have to commit and get started and then figure out all those answers as we go. Because the buildings that you and I build will be there 70 years later. We'll all be long gone, long dead. And our kids will be like, my dad, my mom used to be so proud about doing this, that, the other. And yet what he and she built 
can't withstand the environment that we've left for them in 2050. Yeah. So mine is a challenge. It's a plea. It's a request. COP27 is what? Nine weeks away. I think the 6th of November. At the very least, just commit to doing something, like to being part of the solution by the 6th of November. That would be my request and that would be my sort of plea to my 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 industry and my colleagues. Thanks, Dylan. Well said, well said. Um, and thank you for those uh, remarks. So finally, we'll have Dylan, um, presenter of the ZCPA and um, moderator um, giving his closing. Yeah, I must say we we uh, really had a good productive discussion. We had different perspectives from the government sector, private sector, and public sector. As uh, Marusa, uh, in his closing remarks, said, uh, it is very important that we have to start. It is high time that we stop. We uh, we start. We continue talking about the plans, action plans, roadmaps, and uh, we have to start somewhere. And it is it is important that uh, we have an engagement plan in place as well. As Elizabeth um, mentioned during her closing remarks, uh, we don't need a diploma to to uh, to plant a tree at least. So we can start from basic things to make people aware of the benefits and importance of energy efficiency. The awareness part will be very important. I hope all these webinars, uh, roadmaps, action plans, whatever we do, will have a component on making people aware of the importance and benefits of energy efficiency. So uh so that's it from my side thanks again uh i've heard that uh, kenya green building society is doing a great job and i wish uh, you continue doing uh, such wonderful job too it is a it's always important that such a such a, a, an organization an intermediate immediate kind of an organization is in place to uh, to fill that gap between the people and uh, government bodies to make sure that uh, we are on the right track to make sure that uh, action plans are being developed to make sure that uh, it is be, it is getting implemented on ground and all these things are very very important and i wish uh, kenya clean building society to achieve its objectives going forward as well thank you thank you dylan and uh, the feeling is mutual we do hope to um beyond the zero carbon building accelerator work with the resources institutes to build the built environment and uh, um develop develop it rather for um future. So with that, um, thank you again to the panelists. Thank you again, World Resources Institute for collaborating on this. Thank you to you, the attendees, for all the questions and um, joining in today. And uh, with that, um, have a great rest of the day. See you later. Thanks, Louis. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye.